Hey everybody, this is Ryan E. Louie, and this is the Dig Series. This is episode number eight. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, my experiences um, in the United States Air Force Band. That's the Heartland of America Band. Hey, but first, <clears throat> a shout out. The shout out goes to the concert band percussionist of the Wadsworth High School band, concert band. You folks, you deserve a good shout out. You folks are, are nice kids, great percussionists. And uh, I get to see these folks every Wednesday and every Friday <clears throat> when I'm out there. So kudos to you folks. Anyway, uh, let's get started with episode eight. This is United States Air Force Heartland Band of America. So here we go. When I was at Carnegie Mellon uh, studying uh, with Tim Adams, and I think I talked about him the time before uh, in the last podcast, um, I would go and sub with the Heartland of America Band, and they were stationed out at Offutt Air Force Base, which is in Omaha, Nebraska. So I would um, fly out there, and I would sub in as a civilian in the Air Force Band. So the first time I went, and actually how I how I got the gig was that I ended up through a friend who attended Carnegie Mellon. Her brother was uh, the principal percussionist in the band, and so she was unable to do it. And uh, then uh, I got the call, and so uh, they flew me out there, and I went and subbed at the band. You know, you're gone for about a week, a week and a half, and you do some rehearsals, and then you go on tour. And uh, it was a real fun time. And, and I tell you, the musicians were great. And um, it was a real fun time. And so then after I got done with the gig, um, you know, I flew back home to Pittsburgh. We went out again. And uh, it was actually, I got called to do it again and sub with them. But then they liked me. And so they asked if I wanted to audition for the band. I said, well, uh, let me think about it. And uh, they said, well, you know, you're going out there in, in four days to come sub with us again. You know, we'll fly you out there and uh, you can audition then. We could go from there. And I said, well, OK, what is a required on an audition for uh, an Air Force band? And this one there. And they said, well, um, we already know that you can play and we like your playing. Uh, but just to go through like a, a formal audition, we would need you to have uh, have you play a mallet piece, a snare drum piece, a timpani piece, and also here you play drum set. And so, you know, like I said, this is four days out from uh, when I was scheduled to fly out there and then tour with them. I ended up working up uh, a snare drum solo and a mallet solo, and a timpani excerpt, and then um, a drum set. Uh, I mean, I really actually didn't work out drum set. They just said you'd have to play with a couple of groups and stuff like that. And so anyway, and sight read on all of those instruments. So, I mean, this was, you know, 20, 25, you know, years ago. I ended up working up uh, for Marimba, a piece called Rain Dance, by Alice Gomez, which many of my students, you know, you know the piece, it's a four-mallet piece, and uh, not extremely hard, but certainly, uh, you know, a four-mallet piece. And then I think I did, oh, I did The Downfall of Paris by Haskell Haar, Ludwig, and uh, that was for snare drum. Uh, I did a Goodman exercise for timpani, and then drum set, I went out there. So I had four days to work all this stuff up, and uh, so, uh, anyway, I just started practicing and practicing and practicing. And, um, you know, I, I ended up playing for my professor, Tim Adams, you know, before I left. And, uh, you know, he just, he was real interesting. Like, he would, whenever he'd listen to me play or listen to anybody play and anything like that for an audition, he would sit there with no music. No scores, no nothing. He would just sit there and listen. And then his comments were just like right dead on. And they were just so perfect. And his ears were so gigantic. And um, he mentioned to me, though, a couple of things on the downfall of Paris on the snare drum piece. But he said this, when auditioning, and maybe many of my students know this. I've talked to him about it when auditioning. The stuff that you're great at, make sure that it is really, really, really perfect. 
And as good as that can be, because you're really, really good at it. So the best thing that you're good at, you know, that you're great at, make sure that that stuff uh, really shines and it really, you know, is something that is um, a pleasure to hear and to watch. And the stuff that you're okay at, just make sure that it's okay. But don't let the stuff that you're okay at, if this makes sense, not get in the way of the stuff that you're great at. And so anyway... Uh, I went down there and uh, ended up auditioning, and it was just like they said. You know, I went from the marimba piece to the snare drum piece to timpani, sight reading on all of them. And then I ended up playing with the uh, with a little combo that was there. And uh, anyway, uh, as I got done with the audition, they offered me the job. And um, I kind of went from there. And I asked him, you know, just as, as you do any auditions, if there's any feedback or any comments or anything like that they could give. You know, the principal percussionist said, well, it was your drum set playing that really made sure that it sealed the deal. All the other stuff was very good. But it was actually your drum set that was just like, oh, my gosh, we, we need to have him. <clears throat> Taking an Air Force job like that, uh, I had learned, you know, over my enlistment that you need to be like a hybrid player because you don't know what kind of band you're going to be playing in, whether it be a concert band or a brass quintet or the jazz band that they have there called the Notables. Or they had two other bands, like a rock band and then a country band. And uh, so they all kind of, even though they start off as a concert band, the Heartland of American Band had different segments that they could split off to. You know, an interesting thing about, you know, accepting a job like that, you know, you, you really do have to join the Air Force and go through basic training, and uh, which is in uh, San Antonio at uh, Lackland Air Force Base. If any are Air Force vets, I mean, you know, Uri Air Force, and uh, all of us, you know, should remember Lackland very, very, very vividly anyway. And so, you know, as many of you know me, uh, I'm, I'm the size that I am, and I, I had to lose close to 100 pounds in order to get in the Air Force Band. So even though I subbed in with them, you know, two times and then got offered a job, I really had to make weight, you know, and I was little, I was over 200 pounds, and I needed to be at 184, so I was, you know, you know my regular size. So it took me almost a full year to, like, get that weight off. And, you know, by exercising and you kind of watch what I eat and everything like that. But, I mean, ultimately, you know, it took me that long to lose, lose all that weight. And so uh, I just remember uh, I had a form that in the Air Force, it's called the 385. And what that does is it holds your spot because you audition and it guarantees the band that you audition for, when you once you make it into basic training, through basic training and you graduate, you go right to that duty station and that, you know, you don't have to go anywhere else or do any other job. And so I just remember there's a, a place called MEPS when I was in Pittsburgh that I went to. As soon as I made weight, though, they, the day actually that I made, made weight, and that was, I needed to be 184 and, uh, I just, they shipped me out that day. I just remember going back saying, oh my gosh, I'm going. And, uh, you know, I packed my bags and I was uh, shipped out that day to go to uh, Lachlan Air Force Base. Basic training was very, very interesting because I entered the Air Force Band uh, very late because when I was at Carnegie Mellon, I was like 33. I was, I was 34 when I went in. So I actually joined the Air Force when I was 34. And I think the age limit at that time could have been 36 or 38. So I was pushing that. But that means I had to go through basic training with a bunch of uh, people that were, all, you know, that were also like 19. And so the flight that I was in, you know, was um, a mixture, and I was like almost the oldest. You know, the the question was asked when the, all the flights were there in basic training, if, and this is not to be too graphic, but you know, if like all the sergeants were to be killed, let's say we're in battle or in a war, who would be in charge? And so they made everybody stand up, and then they started like counting off birthdays, you know, years, and I just thought, oh no. 
Yeah, I'm going to be, I'm like, I'm pretty sure I'm the oldest one there. And so as each birthday came, everybody was sitting down, sitting down. There was just a few. I was actually not the oldest. There was one, there was one woman that was actually like two months um, older than me. And uh, the reason that was a little bit, you know, funny and stressful at the same time is at least during basic training, the last thing you wanted to do was uh, to be able to poke out. And uh, even though I would, you know, go get, I would go get chow at the the dining facility. You know, you'd have to walk by the bunch of the training, the TIs. You know, they were sergeants, and uh, you know they would they would comment to me like "old man," you know, "grandpa," and all this kind of stuff because I, you know, I was I was older than them. Anyway, basic training was was a lot of fun, and I say that with a grain of salt because it was very very different. But going in there, you know, like I said, being older, a lot of it is classroom. A lot of it is you know, sitting down and <clears throat> actually they, they, they had a basic training band that we would go to and all the TIs that ran the band, they knew who I was in the, you know, so they said, Louie, you know, you give your reporting statement, teach this. And I, you know, taught the drum line. I mean, I, by then I taught so many drum lines. So I actually taught them like a drum line. And there was like, you know, 25 bass drums, 40 cymbals and, uh, you know, 35 snares and it's just this gigantic number at any rate i just remember getting it back and i taught them i cleaned them i played the whole thing and they you know made fun of me and they said all i wanted you to do was play to this tape but you want to taught them you're a dingling you know anyway so i get through basic training and i graduate and oh i gotta tell one more story like they all knew i could play so you know the the ti the, my you know was in charge of my group would scream at me, go, Louie, get over here. So you run over there with my snare drum because we would play for the graduation ceremonies of all, the, you know, when they would graduate while you're in the band there, like the training band while you're in basic training. And I just remember that I was with my snare drum. They go, play something. And then I had to play a bunch of black steam, this guy, I'm just going to pop, close my sticks. I'm like, awesome, get out of here. You know, it was just this constant, uh, it was very interesting. So anyway, I graduate, I take a little bit of leave, decompress a bit, and then I report to my duty station, which is in Omaha, Nebraska, which I had so many friends there because I had played with the band twice, and they are expecting me to come. It was just such a, a warm welcoming, and uh, I ended up being the, the, um, the principal timpanist and a percussionist inside the band, the concert band, which is like a 45-piece band, all with wonderful, wonderful musicians. And then um, I became the head drum set player of their jazz band, which is called the Notables. And uh, we, we would have the Air Force Band and the jazz band would have an eight-state region that we would go play around. Sometimes we would go all the way out to, to Washington in Washington State, and we'd play out there, and then they'd fly us back. Sometimes we'd go all the way down into Oklahoma and uh, play out there. They would fly us in the C-130s, which is a, you know, a, a plane, a cargo plane, which is really, really interesting. You know, I'm asked, you know, about all the music that we played and all the time that I was in there, what was your favorite thing to play? And, you know, part of our job in the Air Force Band is, you know, PR, public relations, because, you know, you're out there in middle America, and uh, sometimes the only thing that that people get to see are when they come to see a concert, a free concert by the Air, United States Air Force Band, you know, and they come, is they get to see, you know, somebody in uniform. So when you go there, you're representing uh, the Air Force, you're representing your country, which is an honor and awesome. And we played great literature in both bands. And, um, but, you know, one of the, the pieces that always stuck out to me was the armed service medley. So the armed service medley, which some of you know, we play you play it during Veterans Day, where they go through all the um, the different songs of the military, you know, from the Coast Guard to the Navy, Marines, you know, Army, and then Air Force. And, you know, of course we're last because we're the best. And uh, anyway, and we would always like you know, mostly when you're like the Midwest, how many people would stand for the Coast Guard? you know, as we go ahead and play their song. And it was always like we were, you know, trying to guess the numbers of, for each military song that we would play, you know, how many people would stand up. But I always really, really enjoyed playing the Armed Service Medley because, 
you know, we got to celebrate our veterans and really pay homage to their uh, the sacrifice for serving. And that was always a lot of fun. You know, the jazz band, the Notables that I played in, was a really, really great band, you know. And there's nothing like a band where that's your main focus at that time. So when we knew we were getting ready for a TDY or a tour that we would go on, you know, let's say, you know, it's a month before, like every your, your job is that. It's bandsmen. And I'll talk about that in a second. But it's like, so when you would show up, that you just rehearse. That's all you did. You rehearsed during the, you know, the whole morning section was in the afternoon. It could be just rehearsals. And that was your job in the Air Force was that you were just rehearsing. And uh, there were some great players that we played with. You know, the lead trumpet player uh, of that band, he actually came from Ohio. He went to Capitol University. He then took a gig. He won a job with the uh, Glenn Miller Jazz Band. And, you know, for those who remember, who remember who Glenn Miller was or the band still tours to this day. And he was a lead trumpet player, so he had really high screaming chops. Anyway, then he got into the Air Force. He still plays, and I think uh, Chris plays out in the band of the Academy, or the Academy band, which is in uh, Colorado Springs. And is a trumpet player out there. Um, you know, another great thing about, well, anyway, just to get back with the jazz band, is that, you know, we would tour and uh, work up a whole program. And... Um, the great thing about that band is that we had some great soloists. Uh, I mean, just a monster piano player. Actually, my first album I recorded with, um, actually the whole rhythm section, the whole band was an Air Force band. And uh, on piano was Mahesh Balzaria, and he now plays in L.A. Chris Stelling on tenor sax, and now he's retired from the Air Force band and lives out in Kearney, Nebraska, and uh, still plays out there. Uh, Mike Schmaus, one of my great friends. They're all my great friends. Anyway, he's in Pittsburgh right now. And um, the, there's myself on drums. The, I, I flew in a singer, Emily Floor. And uh, so that is that album that I recorded, which is Louis Says You. And uh, anyway, I have, you know, I have that album back in the studio. If you ever take a listen to it, it is, it is a great, great, great album. But those are all Air Force players. And uh, anyway, uh, the band was just super action-packed. We played all chords from like Glenn Miller, Tommy Dorsey, you know, to to the most modern stuff today, from Marie Schneider to uh, uh, Gordon Goodwin, and uh, you know, some of what is considered today's big band composers. And uh, so that was another another great thing is that the concert band that we played in was again filled with wonderful musicians. And it was just um, <clears throat> delightful. I was the principal timpanist in there, so I mainly played timpani. And, um, you know, I'm just going to share one quick story. We were playing at the Tetons Festival out in the Tetons out in uh, Wyoming. We were uh, the featured, featured group. And it was right before the Teton Orchestra got together. And they were playing through the festival, you know, throughout the week. And so we were kind of like one of the bands that went through that opened everything up then the next day. But the percussionists that they had there were some of the world's best percussionists and timpanists. But when the Air Force Band came through, a lot of them came to uh, watch the band play. And I just remember uh, Richard Brown, oh, he was the percussion professor at Rice University. And uh, he was the principal of the Houston Ballet principal percussion. I remember he came up and he said hi to me, you know, before and during intermission. But the big one was, his name was Bob Becker. Bob Becker is one of the greatest percussionists that's walking to earth and one of the greatest xylophone players that exists. And uh, he comes up to me and I knew him from, from before. And Bob comes up, he's like, hey, Ryan, how you doing? I said, Bob Becker, good to see you. Why are you here? He's oh, I, 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 you know, I play with the, the Teton, uh, you know, orchestra, the festival orchestra. And it was just you know, but I see that you're playing a Sousa piece. Are you going to play xylophone on it? And I said, why, uh, yes, I am. And uh, so anyway, uh, I, you know, he goes, oh, I look forward to hearing it. Bob Becker's xylophone rags that he would play, you know, that were composed by George Hamilton Green are, are just, in his rendition of it is like, without a doubt, the world's best, the best I've ever heard. And so... Uh, knowing that Bob Becker, Richard Brown, and all these other percussionists are in the audience watching me play uh, certainly made me uh, as about as anxiety and nervous as one could get. 
at any rate, you know, I ended up playing the piece because it opened up the second half of the concert. And it was fine because I had a double on timpani. I'd play timpani and then walk over, play all this xylophone stuff, then walk back and play. And so I was sweating beads, went over, you know, did my deep breathing stuff that we talked about. And then all of a sudden, you know, I played it. It was great. Went back, played timpani. Hanging out after, Bob was just like, oh, you sounded so great. I said, I tell you what, man, it was a real surprise having you out there. There are many, many, many other stories um, of you know, my tenure in the United States Air Force, Heartland of America band. And, uh, but like I said, the, the, the thing that I, I took away the most from it, uh, was that I got to play with an incredible bunch of musicians that all had the same goal of serving our country. And it's a great country. And that's why I'd always say it is, uh, we would always say it is your United States Air Force band. And uh, I'm very grateful that I was able to do that and uh, be with such incredible uh, musicians and then also airmen and airwomen, of course. And so that is my gratitude, though. I'm going to try and wrap up every series with a gratitude. And my gratitudes are that, you know, I'm still friends with a lot of the people with the Heartland of America band. It still exists today. And, um, you know, I really appreciate my time there and uh, as much literature that I got to play, not only in the Notables Jazz Band and the combo that we played, but also, you know, their symphonic band was just top notch. And uh, we were to play under great conductors and it's some of the best band literature I will ever play with a group like that. And so anyway, that is my story. And this wraps up our, uh, this would be episode eight of the Dig series. Um, you can always subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's R-Y-U-N-L-O-U-I-E. And also you can find all these episodes on my website, which is R-Y-U-N-L-O-U. And I look forward to talking to you on the next one. I am going to interview David Seltzer, my assistant. He he marched at the Wadsworth Center. He was center snare of Wadsworth uh, marching band. And then he went out into Cincinnati and he became center snare of uh, the band out there. So uh, keep in touch. Please comment. And I will see you folks next time. Truth. <laughs>